Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a board-certified anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. I went to Stanford for medical school, Harvard for residency, and now I live in San Francisco. I practice medicine a little differently. I like to look at the whole patient. I like to use natural remedies whenever safely possible. Patients don't always realize that surgery is a major stress around the body and it shouldn't be normalized. I want to show you the behind the scenes of a day in my life so you can see what it's like for yourself. The day starts when the OR is going to start. Usually that's between 5 and 6 a.m. You see my cup of water there next to me? I like to drink a cup of water to get the bowel movements rolling in time for the day. And on these summer mornings, there's some nice sunlight, some nice vitamin D before the day gets started. I always spend 5 to 10 minutes meditating, followed by my exercise set, 100 push-ups, followed by some core abs, and then another 100 push-ups before I go downstairs and take care of the doggy. My wife has already gone to work today, so I have to take our puppy Karma out on her walk. And you can see she cannot wait to get out of the house, been in her crate all night. I didn't really appreciate the benefits of dog ownership until my wife pushed us to get a dog, and they are incredible. You can check out my videos on them. You can see our dog can't wait to get to the park, loves chasing kids, and once we get to the park, she's a center of attention. She loves playing with the other dogs, loves making a mess for me to clean up, and she loves not wanting to leave the park. Karma, wrong way! She just doesn't get that her dad's got to go to work in the morning. And then, sometimes we have to carry her home. That's right. Is that right, Karma? Gotta carry you home? One last obligatory goodbye, and we're off. So the morning commute. There aren't many anesthesiologists in the Bay Area, unfortunately. So I'm gonna drive pretty far to cover surgery centers and hospitals and whatnot around the Bay Area. It could be anywhere from 15 or 20 minutes to hour plus one way. Luckily in the mornings, there isn't that much traffic. And in the Bay Area, we get all sorts of beautiful views like you saw the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge or anything around. So. I use the time to enjoy the scenery, use the time to plan out difficult cases, kind of mentally prepare for what's coming up ahead during the day. If there are any complicated patients or complicated cases, mentally getting ready, because preparation is obviously key during surgery. Alas, the beautiful commute's gotta come to an end. I run straight to the locker room and get ready. Gotta get my hat on, get my stethoscope on here. Let's do it. Gotta look good. When I first come into the operating room, I have to set up all the equipment because this is all the life support with all the breathing tubes and what effectively keeps the patient alive when they're under anesthesia. Because anesthesia is not like sleep. You're actually in a deep medical coma. All the medications that we give, like propofol and all the other opioids, the anesthesia gases, these actually take you right on the brink of a coma and we need you there so that you don't move during the surgery because we need you to be safe for your surgery. That's why we have the fancy life support machine, the ventilator. So when I come in the morning, I need to make sure everything is working. I have to connect everything to our machine. This is what will transport all the oxygen from the machine into the breathing tube into your lungs when you're asleep. So I connect it like this. I have to check the machine to make sure that it's working because I don't want to have any surprises when someone's under anesthesia. I want to be absolutely certain that everything is working. Don't leave anything to chance. Check to make sure that we can generate pressure with our machine like this. And once all that is set, the other part are all the monitors that go on. So one of the most important ones is the pulse ox. I put it on to check to make sure it's picking up the waveform. We'll see that in a second. I also check probably the most important of all the monitors is the breath monitor. It measures the carbon dioxide that I breathe out and that the patient breathes out. This little guy I check by breathing into just a little bit because we take in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide, and sure enough on here, you see that little blip there, that shows that I'm breathing, that I'm taking oxygen in and breathing out carbon dioxide. And I check to make sure that I have the breathing tube. This is what's called an endotracheal tube. This goes in to your mouth after you're asleep, it goes in like that into the back of your mouth, into your trachea, right up to your lungs so they can take oxygen and anesthesia gas from the machine into your lungs so that your lungs can take it into your brain. We have all sorts of other tools here like this is called a laryngoscope. I actually have to use this, goes into the back of the mouth as well to lift up the tongue so that breathing tube can go in. The motion is like this into the mouth, lift up, and you have to place the breathing tube into the back of the mouth there. I have to make sure that the light works. You see there's a light there because I need to be able to see what's in the back of the mouth. I can't place the breathing tube if it's dark there. Then I need to also check for emergency airway equipment. So that's why I check to make sure we have the, it's called a laryngeal mask, an LMA. I don't open them up, I just make sure that they're available in case of an emergency. I have to make sure that we have 
what's called an oral airway, a nasal airway. These are other ways that we can help the patient breathe if the endotracheal tube isn't going in or if there's an airway emergency. I always need to make sure I have these things ready to go immediately by my side. I have to check to make sure that we have enough anesthesia gas in the ventilator. I gotta fill it up every day before work, make sure that I have the medication I need. In the anesthesia cart, you can see all of our medications here, excluding the controlled meds. So no opioids like fentanyl, nothing like midazolam or ketamine. I have to draw it up every morning, make sure I have enough of it. That white is why they call it the milk of amnesia. It's a play off of milk of magnesium. You can see me drawing up some lidocaine here. I like to wear gloves when doing it so that things don't absorb through my skin. That lidocaine can help reduce the burn of propofol. I have some controlled medications here. It's called fentanyl. I'm sure you've heard of it there. Midazolam, also known as Versetta. So these controlled medications don't just live unlocked in the anesthesia cart. I need to be given them by a nurse who takes them out of a locked box every day with a count. We need to have witnesses to make sure that nothing's getting diverted. And then I also have my ultrasound. I always keep this in my back pocket because I use this for my nerve blocks and whenever I need to do injections. And then probably the least sexy of all, but the most important potentially is the suction. So this guy is a suction. The shape of it here is so it can go in the back of your mouth like this. If a patient is ever vomiting or has blood coming up and I need to place the breathing tube in, if I can't see where the breathing tube is going, it's not a good day. So I have to have the suction always on hand, ready to suck stuff out. That might be coming out of the mouth, out of the lungs, out of the stomach, if they're vomiting or something. Once the room is set up, I need to go say hi to the patient and learn all about their medical history, perform my physical exam, answer their questions about the anesthesia. I ask you a couple of questions to make sure we do the anesthesia safely, and then I get to answer your questions about the anesthesia. Anesthesia is a big deal, and before surgery, I need to ask about their heart health, their brain health, their lung health, how their kidneys are doing, and I need to listen to their heart, lungs, and do a thorough physical exam. This includes the mouth exam in particular, looking at their mouth, teeth, tongue, what the back of their throat looks like. This is all very important so I know what kind of breathing tube to place and to make sure that we don't have any problems with oxygenating and ventilating the patient during surgery. And then there's the dreaded IV placement. Patients are always concerned that the IV needle stays inside of them once the IV goes in. I wanna show you that it's just a flexible nylon catheter that stays inside the skin once the IV is placed. There's no sharp needles or any metal inside the skin at that point, so you can move your hand, wrist, and arm around comfortably. It really isn't that bad. I have to start with a tourniquet to bring out the veins. I need to tap on the hands as well. That also helps the veins pop out. Once I find a good target, I get my gloves on, and I put a little bit of lidocaine first to numb up the skin and place that little IV catheter in there, tape it over, and then we're pretty much ready for surgery. A lot of the anesthesia that I do is for orthopedic surgery where we're doing nerve block either in the shoulder, arms, knee, or the ankle, and I use an ultrasound to help deposit lidocaine-like medication to help numb those nerves up. That's what I'm doing here for this surgery. The nurse helps inject, and I can help numb those nerves before we go to sleep. In this case here, I'm doing it for a shoulder surgery where the nerves are actually around the shoulder going into the shoulder and arm. Once we're done with the nerve blocks, we're ready for the operating room and I wheel the patient in. I usually try to give them a little bit of relaxing medication so that the rest of the ride is smooth. Now is the most critical part of my job, the most important part of surgery and anesthesia is falling asleep. I first begin by filling up the lungs with oxygen as the patient breathes through that mask. And then I check to make sure that my IV is running and we go off to sleep. In this case, I'm pushing that white medication there, that propofol. And before we fall asleep is a powerful opportunity to make suggestions while the brain is disinhibited from the anesthetic medications that I've given. This is similar to a form of hypnosis. There's a lot of evidence for how it can help perioperative safety, less nausea, less blood loss, all by empowering the patient. Next, I place tape over the eyelids to protect the eyes while the patient's asleep because you don't make as many tears under anesthesia and the risk of corneal abrasions is real. I then have to prepare to place the breathing tube. This is also one of the most important steps in all of anesthesia because once the patient's asleep and they're not breathing, I need to connect them to the ventilator to help them breathe. You can imagine that this can be really dangerous if we can't get the airway in and we can't breathe with the patient. It's like holding your breath for many, many minutes and you can have heart attacks and strokes if the oxygen levels get too low. So that's why this is one of the most critical steps. You see me pushing that green bag there, that's to help get the first breaths into the patient once they're asleep. I try to use my hips there, not my gloves, so I don't contaminate that green bag, that's what I'm doing. I next have to get all the anesthesia on board, have to adjust the flow rates of the oxygen through the ventilator, and before you know it, drapes are coming up so we can get surgery started. This is what my setup looks like with the patient on my left, my anesthesia machine on my right, with the medications immediately available, and I'm constantly monitoring. You can see that the ventilator has numbers, the monitor has all sorts of numbers from the heart rate to the pulse oximeter values. 
the end tidal concentrations. I have to monitor these constantly because they change throughout surgery and I need to give medications and adjust the ventilator to accommodate any blood loss, any changes in heart or lung function. It's constant monitoring, constant interventions like me here, drawing up some medications so they can give them IV to the patient to help support the rest of their body while they're in this comatose state. This is all to help regulate the heart, kidney, brain, lungs. This is all to support all these organs in the body when they're not able to be supported by themselves under anesthesia in that comatose state. You also see me wearing this lead apron. That's because they're shooting x-rays in the operating room and I need to protect myself from the x-rays. At the end of the case, I take the tape off of the patient and I get ready to remove the breathing tube. Now is the second most important part of anesthesia and surgery, and that is waking up, because I need to make sure that the patient is fully ready to have the breathing tube removed. They're not ready and they're not breathing on their own, or if they have serious sleep apnea, then I might be stuck there with a patient who's not breathing, who's at risk for a heart attack or a stroke. You can see the breathing tube that comes out. This one is a special breathing tube called a laryngeal mask apparatus, or an LMA. It's a one-time use, so I throw it away because it's covered in all sorts of gunk from the patient. To make sure that the patient is breathing, I actually just put my forearm over their face and I can tell when they're breathing because the warm air hits my skin and I know that they're exchanging some oxygen. This patient's doing very well here in recovery, but you can imagine that if they're not breathing well, then I may need to help breathe for them, either go back to sleep and place the breathing tube again or manually breathe with another type of oxygen mask. At the end of successful surgery, we wheel out the patient into the recovery area where the nurse can monitor the patient to make sure that they're breathing well, their pain is under control, they're not too nauseous, and I need to head back to the operating room to clean up and prepare for the next case. At the end of the cases, I need to dispose of all the drugs that I didn't use because I can't reuse syringes and medications on different patients, of course. So I have a whole bunch of meds here on the table. You can see, for example, the propofol here, I gotta get rid of it. I like to wear gloves because some of these medications can go through the skin and I don't want to be getting fentanyl or propofol or whatever going into my blood and into my brain, of course, while I'm at work. So dispose of them. You can see all the other drugs in here along with all the sharps. If I'm wasting a controlled medication like midazolam or fentanyl or ketamine, I need to do that with a witness watching. All of it has to be recorded into a logbook to make sure that no one is diverting any of these controlled medications. Those are a little bit more complicated. I have to log what I've used and what I've wasted for every patient. And then that all has to be recorded and any unused medications have to go back into a locked box. So it doesn't go in here with the rest of the meds. These are uncontrolled. These ones don't need to have a witness watching as they go in and go out. Anesthesia and surgery can be really fun when you know who your coworkers are and you're all well trained and can take care of the patient safely and have fun while doing so. But sometimes emergencies happen and when emergencies happen in the operating room, it's serious. We're talking CPR, running codes, pushing epinephrine, chest compressions, and it can be really serious. So that's why this job is so stressful. We make it look easy because we've done it so many times and we've spent years and years and years training, but there's so much that happens behind the scenes and sometimes when the unexpected happens, it can be really stressful, unfortunately. That's why I always want patients to know the risks of surgery, the risks of anesthesia, and if they can live a life that helps prevent them from ever having to come to the operating room, that's a win-win for everyone and that's what I would love for my patients. They never have to see them in the operating room. Break time. I try to down an apple or two between cases, time permitting. You see behind me in the break room is the bathroom. There's no bathroom in the operating room and I can't leave the patient alone under anesthesia. So I can't pee or use the bathroom otherwise during surgery. So I got to use my time between cases to run to the bathroom, get a little bit of food in me and get ready to see the next patient to keep the day going. Running around between cases like from urology to orthopedics, foot and ankle or an elbow or a shoulder is a little bit of a challenge to practice medicine the way that I believe it should be practiced. That is without medications or supplements whenever possible. So what are we doing here in the operating room, right? Well, it's because if a patient's body is a little bit out of whack, they might need some gentle plant medications or supplements. But if the patient's body goes too far out of its baseline status, then there might be a powerful role for our conventional Western medications and surgery and powerful anesthetic agents so we can get the patient back to where they were before, hopefully living a life that's healthy without medications and without the cost burden, the annoyance of having to take extra supplements and all that. At the end of the day, I drop off the last patient and make sure all the patients are tucked in with their hearts, lungs, everything sounding normal, making sure that they're comfortable, not nauseous, and then I need to head back to the operating room to get ready to go. At the end of the day, I have to close out all my medications, return my controlled medications, then I have to clean up everything on my anesthesia machine, close up the cart, and then get home because I wanna see my wife, I wanna see the dog Karma, I wanna get back to my life at home. 
So let's get out of here. I hope you enjoyed seeing behind the scenes of the operating room where there's so much potential to heal patients back to a life without meds and supplements. But there's also risks with surgery and anesthesia. There's stress on the patient's body. They're in a medical coma. And we as your doctors see this every day because it's our job. And when we see opportunities that could have prevented this from happening, we naturally think what went wrong? What in the system funneled this patient to end up on our OR table? Because we don't want anyone on our OR table if they can help it. We want patients to be healthy without the need for medications, supplements, or surgery and anesthesia if it can be prevented. So this is why I'm so passionate about prevention and finding why the system is pushing people into needing intensive medical interventions. Could it be avoided? What could we do to help our patients not end up on the OR table? That's what we care about. And when I get home, I'm lucky to be greeted by karma, but then also wants to play in the car and not leave. So I don't know what to do here sometimes. I do need to get upstairs eventually and get my workout in here. I like to do variation of upper body and lower body. And I'm lucky enough to be able to exercise outside and I need to water the garden as well to make sure that all of our vegetables are grown well. I'm really fond of the jasmines that we have. You can see that Karma likes to watch as I do my weights. She's a little bit lazy sometimes, but she likes to be involved as my cheerleader there when I'm on the bike. Before dinner, I try to call my patients for the next day to learn about their medical history and answer their questions about anesthesia. Obviously, anesthesia can be very scary before surgery, so I try to call the patients ahead of time and put their minds at ease, answer their questions. I feel it helps a lot with their comfort on the day of surgery when they already have all their questions answered from the night before. Finally, it's dinner time. My wife is an awesome cook, and I'm really grateful that she directs me to help make healthy and delicious food. At the end of the day, I need to say goodnight to Karma, get ready to crate her, and hit the sack myself to get ready for another early morning. I hope you learned some exciting behind the scenes medical secrets and maybe something about my life as well. But keep asking your questions. There's always more to learn in medicine. If anyone thinks they've learned enough, they're probably not on top of the ball. So leave your questions below and subscribe to learn more medical secrets.